An order of battle are the units, formations, and equipment of a military force. Today, I'm going to describe the order of battle in Gaza for both Hamas with its Qassam forces, along with the IDF, or Israeli Defense Forces, and its military. So to start, I, I want to show you something. This is kind of a commercial for ground news, but kind of not. Uh, you might actually learn something here. Remember that explosion at the Gaza hospital a few days ago? Ground News can actually show you the different news outlets that covered the story, and I want to show you this. So both CNN and NBC have a high factuality rating, but look at this bias rating. They lean left, and they got the story wrong, assuming that hundreds were killed in the hospital blast. But if you go to Sky News Australia, you see it was a barbaric terrorist. Israel denies responsibility for attack on hospital in Gaza. So who are you supposed to believe? Well, that's kind of the advantage of using ground news. Now, when this Gaza invasion kicks off, there's going to be a lot of civilian casualties and a lot of misinformation. Uh, the, the casualties could be as high as 300 civilian casualties per day. And I'll show you how I arrived at that toward the end of the video. And we all have that family member who just refuses to listen, right? Ground news can help show you those biases and maybe let them know that the news source isn't totally accurate. Uh, I actually have a Vantage subscription to Ground News, which I paid for myself. Uh, it's kind of neat because it allows you to see who owns what news source that you consume, and you can realize whether this is independent or part of a conglomerate with its own agenda. So go to ground.news slash Ryan McBeth. It'll help you and that wackadoodle land of yours stay fully informed. Subscribe through my link for as little as a dollar a month or get 30% off unlimited access for this month only. Uh, like I said, I bought it. It's, it's a useful tool. Now, uh, when it comes to the order of battle, there are two major players on board. You have Qassam, which is the military arm of Hamas in the Gaza Strip, and you have the IDF, or Israeli Defense Forces, which is the military arm of Israel. Now, since Hamas really doesn't release any figures for its strength, we have to estimate using papers from experts and, and open source information, as well as claims that Hamas has made. Hamas has between 15,000 to 40,000 fighters organized into six or so brigades. Note that a, a brigade is a military unit that can fight and sustain for some period of time. Typically, a brigade in a NATO army is between 2,500 and 5,000 soldiers, but that might not be the case with Qassam. In that case, brigade might be an aspirational title rather than an accurate naming convention. Each brigade has several, so we're talking two or three battalions, as task and maneuver elements. Typically, each croissant battalion has four combat companies and one headquarters company. That one headquarters company contains mortars, rockets, snipers, anti-tank forces, staff and logistics. The four other combat companies contain four platoons of five squads each, and each squad contains between five and 11 combatants. The brigade may also contain an anti-aircraft unit of indeterminate size, which may contain heavy machine guns and possibly man pads or man portable air defense systems. They also contain logistics and engineer elements. Typically, these brigades may operate independently with ammunition and supplies in pre-positioned caches. So there should be caches in tunnels all over Gaza. One final thing. Hamas used drones and operational acts of flood on October 7th, 2023. So while we don't have any hard data about their drone capability, it can be assumed that they may have small DIJ observation and maybe even armed drones that could be operating at battalion level. It's most likely that there's one brigade in the north of Gaza, uh, Gaza City really, one to the east, one to the south, one in central Gaza, one in Khan Yunus, and one in Rafa. For weapons, Qassam tends to have a mix of small arms and light machine guns of both American and Soviet design. There is no standardization. For anti-tank warfare, they have the RPG-7 in both Soviet and Chinese variants. Now, they may have more uh, advanced anti-tank weapons like the AT-3 Sager, the AT-4 Spigot, and supposedly anti-tank guided missiles were fired at Israeli vehicles in 2012, and those missiles may have been Russian Concours or Coronet missiles that were brought from Iran. So they may have that in their inventory. 
For anti-aircraft duty, they have Dishka heavy machine guns, and they may have copies of Soviet SA-7 IGLA missiles. They also have 81 millimeter mortars, most likely of Iranian manufacture, as well as mines and IEDs or improvised explosive devices of various types. Finally, they have unguided rockets. These are more like terror weapons than actual useful battlefield weapons. Uh, they're too inaccurate to fire at a military unit unless that unit is massing on the border and just staying in one place. These rockets consist of the Qassam 1, 2, and 3, and, and yes, Qassam is also the name of a missile. When it comes to training, that's kind of fuzzy too, but there is an actual training program. Uh, for youth, there is a six to seven day program for young men where they learn the basics of weapon handling and tactics. There's also training programs where militants travel to Syria, Iran, and Lebanon, and programs where advisors from those countries come to Gaza and they train units. For communication, Qassam uses portable radios that may or may not feature basic encryption, cell phones, landlines, and of course, runners. Qassam, the unit here, not the rocket, is run by Mohammed Dib Ibrahim Masari, which is one of Israel's most wanted men. They uh, nicknamed him Mohammed Dif, meaning guest in Arabic, because he's constantly moving around. He's been in the organization since 1990, and supposedly all the tunnels around Gaza were his brainchild. Now, let's talk about Israel. Israel contains five active duty infantry brigades that are heavily mechanized. They have a paratroop brigade and a special forces brigade. They also have four active duty armored brigades and two active duty artillery regiments. Now, everybody has heard of Israel's call up of uh, 360,000 reservists. These reservists will round out 13 infantry brigades, of which two brigades of paratroopers, nine are armored brigades, and up to four artillery regiments. Equipment varies depending on whether you're active duty or reservist. Now, for the most part, the IDF carries the X95 Tavor or the M4 rifle. They also have the negative light machine gun and the mag medium machine gun. For light armor work and bunker busting, they carry the Matador. Uh, for anti-tank work, they have the Spike. The IDF also uses 60, 81, and 120 millimeter mortars, although they seem to favor the 120 millimeter mortar since they're so heavily mechanized. The average Israeli active duty soldier has a modern kit with modern body armor, helmet, and night vision, although reservists may have older equipment. For vehicles, the IDF has a Merkava 3 and 4 tanks, with 4 going to active duty and the rest uh, 3 models shunted to reservists. Note that one unique feature of the Merkava is that its rear hatch can act as an armored personnel carrier and you could fit a couple of guys in there. So you can actually use the Merkava to do a CASAVAC or a casualty evacuation. The tank also comes with a 60 millimeter mortar that can be used for illumination or infantry support. Israel has over 5,000 armored personnel carriers in reserve, although most of those variants are the American M113 armored personnel carrier that they call the Zelda. Their primary active duty armored personnel carrier is an Emir, which is essentially a Merkava hall with a remote weapon station. One quick note, both the Merkava 4 and the uh, Namir are equipped with a trophy active protection system, which can shoot down incoming rockets and missiles. But based on recent footage, it doesn't appear that system is effective against drone dropped munitions. Israel also has two artillery regiments, mainly consisting of 155 millimeter and 109A5 guns or the M270 MLRS. Now, when it comes to recruiting and training, Conscription is required among all Jewish and Druze men and women who are not ultra-Orthodox. Some Arab Christians choose to serve as well as Arab Muslims, uh, many of whom are Bedouins from the South. Men serve for 32 months, women serve for 24 months. Note that many in Israel consider the military to be kind of like jury duty. It's something you have to do and you're proud of yourself, but you don't necessarily want to go back. So. Few Israeli soldiers remain on active duty, and many who do become officers. Everybody else becomes a reservist. 
Men stay reservists until age 40, although it's longer for officers and certain technical specialties, as well as physicians. Women serve as reservists until age 38, but in practice, women above the age of 24 rarely return to duty. On the Air Force side, Israel has a professional Air Force that is one of the best in the world. They have three squadrons of F-15s, 10 squadrons of F-16s, and three squadrons of F-35s. And a squadron is about eight to 24 aircraft. For ground attack, they're mainly armed with various versions of the JDAM, Joint Direct Attack Munition, and the small diameter bomb. Also note that the IAF, or Israeli Air Force, also operates the Apache helicopter, the Black Hawk, and the Stallion, with uh, the Apache able to fire Spike and Hellfire missiles. So that's the order of battle. So what's the plan for the ground invasion? Well, imagine painting the corner of a wall. You cut in through the left and go up. Israel will probably cut across this one strip of land. It will set up forces to the south on the defense and then send forces into Gaza City to clear buildings and tunnels house by house. Once that done, it may move south, clearing the rest of the Gaza Strip. It is not going to be easy. It is going to be house to house, tunnel to tunnel. When they encounter a machine gun position, a sniper position, anti-armor launcher position, they'll most likely destroy that from the air with a precision strike or with artillery. So we're probably gonna see something more akin to the 2008 Battle of Sadr City in Iraq, which took 45 days, instead of something like the Yom Kippur War that, that happened in the desert. We're talking about moving 200 to 500 meters a day meaning the operation, at least in the north in Gaza City, will take anywhere between 20 to 50 days, 20 at the low end, 50 at the high end. If we use Operation Cast Lead and uh, the Battle of Sadr City as a template, on the Israeli side, you should expect to see three casualties per day on the low end and 16 casualties per day on the high end. On the Qassam side, expect to see between 7 and 66 casualties per day. Also expect to see anywhere between 13 and 40 civilian casualties per day, although that number could be as high as 300 casualties per day if you count wounded civilians. Hey guys, I want to break into this video for a moment because as I was editing this video, and the editing process can take days, uh, I released a short video where I released these casualty counts. My old boss, this guy up here, Major Adam Kraft, he saw that video and he called me and he said that I was wrong. And uh, he made a short recording uh, to explain why I was wrong. So I wanna play this recording for you, uh, which he gave me permission to do, um, to give you a different perspective that maybe my casualty counts are too low. Ryan, you're slightly off on your mount casualty calculations by a factor of a third. I say this because I don't think you took into account the amount of improvised explosive devices, IEDs, and more specifically EFPs we encountered in our time in the region. The explosively formed projectiles perfected by Iran and employed by third parties like Hamas are going to be difficult to engage and clear in the fights occurring just back from the leading edge of these IDF company teams, conducting what is likely the largest urban combat operation since the Second World War. We're looking at multi-division coordinated operations also involving indirect fire capabilities. Even the U.S. military did not deploy in Iraq just because they weren't fielded yet. I agree with your use of CAS lead as a baseline. Iran has facilitated Hamas's ability to totally impregnate the landscape and building facades throughout the Gaza territories. And Hamas will also use both their human shields captured from inside Israel and their own civilians to full effect here, which will complicate the IDF's maneuver both on foot and their vehicles. IDF tactical eyes may also be hindered by Iranian procured counter unmanned systems tech which will eventually be disrupted by the five superior Israeli capabilities. However, the longer these Iranian or Russian or Chinese capabilities in Hamas hands stay relevant in the urban fight, the more IDF and trapped civilian lives will be lost. I'm personally afraid of the introduction of chemical weapons into the fight by Hamas, like rudimentary chlorine or the so-called super bleach bombs, which have been used in the past regionally with mild effect on operations, but are 
more devastating to the civilians in the area. So what about end state? What does victory look like for Hamas and what does victory look like for Israel? So to start, just like Ukraine, there is no winner here. There is no win. There is only lose and lose less. But for Hamas, winning means surviving. If they can drag out the conflict until a humanitarian crisis is created and the world demands that Israel stop, that's the win. The win is surviving. What does victory look like for Israel? Victory looks like destroying Hamas and Qusam completely as a military force. Needless to say, it's easier for Hamas to win than for Israel to win because if just one single Hamas fighter remains, he can ignite the fire of revolution into the minds of all who were displaced during this operation. I want to end with this. There's a video I saw on Twitter of Israeli soldiers dancing as the Iron Dome intercepted missiles in the background. And this made me really, really depressed because they don't know what I know. That if you survive what's coming for you in the next couple of days, it will consume you for the rest of your life. I was also reminded of another video of a Qassam fighter who was wounded on October 7th during that Operation Al-Aqsa flood raid. Instead of helping him, his buddies stripped him of his gear and ammunition and left him there to die. You might have this glorious fantasy of becoming a Shaheed, becoming a martyr. And when you're lying on the ground and death is an instant, it's taking its time and it's painful, and your buddies are fighting over your gear, you might think, maybe I've been hanging out with the wrong crowd. Thank you for watching.